1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we are. We're going to go through the first 13 verses and see what happens, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's read through this and then we'll get started. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and all did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this scripture today. Thank you. I know so many of us have memorized portions of this text right here, uh, and we have relied heavily on this text over the years to give us comfort and strength through our temptations and through our trials. God, I pray as we uh, go verse by verse through this that your spirit would open up our minds and give us understanding, and that, God, you would grant us a greater knowledge of who you are, a true understanding, and that uh, understanding would result in a deeper relationship, a commitment, and intimacy with you. God, we really do want to bear your image. Would you bless now our time here this evening? Would your will be accomplished, we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so we have been going through, obviously, verse by verse through this the book of the Bible. Uh, the church of Corinth is not exactly your model church. Uh, the last, probably verse chapters 8, 9, and 10, a lot of them have to do with liberty, and uh, liberty is such an important topic in the Scripture, and for the Christian to have, we see the truths that have been set forth in chapter 8 and, and chapter 9, that we are set free from the bondage of sin, from the power of Satan, from, the, from even from the law, but in chapter 8, we are told that we are not to use our liberty Liberty is a, a stumbling block. Remember we gave that illustration. Uh, if a blind man to, were to, to walk in, uh, down the street and if you were to put something in front of them so that they would fall over, he says, what kind of person would do that? That's a stumbling block, okay? So if you know somebody is going to fall, if you were to do something, if they were to see you or, or if you were to partake of something and they were to be uncomfortable in this and they would fall in their faith, they would become weak. And he says, he says don't use your liberty. Even though maybe there's not a, 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 a the Bible Bible does not specifically condemn what you're doing. He says, do not do that. We gave the instance of there was different uh, uh, meats that the Jews would eat or would not eat, whether it was uh, temple meat or not. Okay, I use the example of inviting a, a Muslim family into your home and serving pork. Okay? It's not going to go over real well, those types of things. Uh, there's uh, struggles that people have that have been alcoholics their whole life and have come out of that, and now you are, uh, you know, you, you ask them if they want a beer. Okay? Maybe not the best idea. Okay? The, or maybe to, to meet with them for lunch at a local bar or something. It may just be too much for them to handle that time. So the Bible says to be careful not to be a stumbling block to those that are around you. We are to use our liberty to pursue God, to edify the body of believers, to exhibit faith. We are to use the liberty in which the Scripture, in such a way the Scripture does not forbid as long as it is not morally long. Paul had this intent desire. We saw this in chapter 9, this intense desire to reach people. And so he was willing to use his liberty uh, to reach into different cultures. 
We talked about Hudson Taylor and, and how he changed his appearance so that he could reach the Chinese people. Uh, oftentimes uh, in Zambia, we had to do the same thing. We had to change the way we dressed, the way we talked, the way we approached each other. The conversations we had all had to be modified so that we could talk to people. And he says, this we do for the gospel's sake, right? We're not doing this simply so that everybody gets along, so that there's peace in this world. No, we do this for the sake of the gospel, okay? I was talking to someone last week after the message, and, you know, I was using this illustration about China and using this illustration about Africa, and this person, this person pointed out that we have even subcultures in the United States, don't we? we there's, there, there's Ukrainian culture, isn't there, Mike? Okay, uh, there is uh, Spanish and Mexican. We just had the Puerto Rican festival was, uh, was this weekend. There is a lot of different cultures. And, and when I look at certain people, you know what I do? I, I look at certain people, you know, their pants are kind of pulled down, right? And, and they, they wear funny. And then there's other people, their clothes are skin tight. And they roll their pants up. And, they, and, there's, and I look at them and go, man, they're weird, they're not like me, so something must be wrong. That's what culture says. When you look at somebody and they're not like you, you automatically assume that there's something wrong, okay? But he says, uh, he, he, he says in all this thing that we are to uh, become all things to all men, that we might win some. See, uh, the, we're, we, we, we talked about being fishermen, right? We talked about trying to reach people with the gospel. And, and there's, there's different ways to do that for different people, just like there's different way for fish to, to be, you know, we can use that snag hook, we can use a lure, we can use a worm, okay? Uh, we can use a big net, whatever it is. There's different methods and different ways to catch fish, and we have to figure out how to do that dependent upon the culture and the area in which we live. And, and, and this may sound um, deep, but listen, if the fish aren't biting, you're doing something wrong, right? Why would you just keep doing the same thing over and over if the fish aren't biting, okay? When you stick that thing out there and they don't want the worm and they don't want the lure, then you've got to find something that they do like because fish are hungry and they eat, okay? So if they're not eating from you, it's because you're not doing something right, okay? So when we talk about trying to reach this world, uh, trying to become all things to all men, and then we're not getting anything on our hook, we're not actually reaching anybody, then maybe we need to evaluate what we're doing to say we are not reaching our culture and our people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is one of the primary functions of this church, Got a big bold sign out in the foyer right there. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We've got missionaries that go around the world to preach the gospel. And we've got to do the same thing right here in our own neighborhoods. This last Sunday, we had so many visitors, so many people I've never saw in my life. <laughs> and I thought, man, I'm excited for our church. I'm excited the people of First Bible are talking to their neighbors and trying to bring them into church and, and, and allowing the Word of God to penetrate their hearts. Now that's what we want to see take place. We want to see God doing a work in people's lives, not just to fill our seats, not just to say we're, we're doing something, but that Christ would be worshipped. Okay? That is the ultimate goal of missions. Some people say, well, I want people to go to heaven. Other, other missionaries, are, I don't want people to go to hell. And those are good reasons. But the primary reason we want people to come to Christ and the knowledge of the truth and, and, and have reconciliation and forgiveness of sin is because that Jesus Christ is worthy to be praised. And unregenerate lost people do not praise God. Saved people are able to exalt the holy name of God. And so we want every nation, every tribe, every people, every tongue from around this world to be able to bow down before him and give him the honor that is due his name, okay? So we live in different cultures. We've talked about that. We are to self-limit ourselves, to adapt, to modify our lifestyle, to be more of a witness to the world around us. We are to be a witness to our own brethren. We don't want people to stumble. We are to be a witness to the people in this world to effectively reach people. So now chapter 10 illustrates how our liberties can affect our own life, how the misuse of liberty can disqualify us 
from effective service to Christ. And so ancient Israel is going to provide multiple examples and sobering illustrations of the pitfalls of the overconfident Christian life, if you will. And he says in this text, we are going to learn from their examples. Man, it's hard to learn from other people's example, you know. I, I've got a daughter that I can tell her what to do. I can ask her if she understands it. But she just, she needs to feel the pain to learn. It's just amazing, you know. Yep, I did, I understand, I get it. Yep, and then she's just going to do it and go, ow. You did exactly what I told you not to do, right? I mean, that's just, that's not wise. See, it really is hard to learn from people's example. Many of us, we go through life in this trial and error process, uh, just kind of trying to figure it out instead of actually learning from other people. And so we go through this text today, and hopefully we here this day in August in Rochester, New York, can learn from the ancient people of Israel. We can learn from the people of Corinth, and we too will not make the same mistakes that they have made. So we see in verse 1, right, I would not that you should be ignorant, okay? I don't want you to live in this, in this place of ignorance. I don't want you to uh, not have knowledge in all of this. He says, how all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and they were all baptized unto Moses in the, in the sea, and, uh, and they did all eat the same spiritual meat and that same spiritual rink, the, uh, drink. Uh, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ, okay? So there's a typology that is presented here. A typology is, a, uh, 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 is, is, is of that of spiritual salvation, okay? The children of Israel, of Israel are going to be delivered, okay? There is a, a man that is going to come in, and by great strength, he is going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, which is a representation of the world. He's going to bring them out of that bondage, which is a picture of sin, and he's going to deliver them from the power of Pharaoh, which is a picture of Satan, okay? And he's going to take them through that Red Sea, which is a picture of that baptism, that, that, that picture that says, you know, I am associated with God and I am with God in all of this. Now I want you to be careful that we don't simply say, well because they left Israel that they were then saved, okay? That they were all just automatically believers. That's not what we're talking about here, right? Uh, salvation is always an act of faith by the individual. The type or the picture that we're talking about is that of the people coming out of Egypt, coming out of sin. And so we see this taking place with Israel, yet we see they do not enter the promised land, and we're going to go through that, okay? So they've come out of Egypt, they've come out of bondage, they've come out of the power of sin and the power of Satan, they've crossed over the Red Sea, and they're going to go into the land of the wilderness, they've been told they're supposed to go into the land of promise, into the abundant life, they're supposed to receive of these things, a land that floweth with milk and honey, but they're not going to. And the reality is, many of us are going to receive the promise. We are going to uh, we are going to be saved. Okay, we are going to be removed from sin and the power of Satan. But we're not going to enter the promised land that God has for us. We're going to end up spending our entire life in the wandering land. That's not what God wants for us. Okay, these people, the people of Israel, they saw the power of God, and and they uh, above all people ex had an amazing view of what God could do, okay? Every day they woke up and they would see the glory of God. Every day they would wake up and they would see the, uh, 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 the cloud that would lead them and the pillar of fire at night. And every day manna would be provided for them, literally. They were in the wilderness. There was no food. There was no water. There was no way for them to provide for themselves. So every day God had to give them a food or they would have perished. God provided water for them. They literally Literally, for 40 years, they saw the provision and the help and the strength and the, and the goodness of God, and yet they didn't enter the promised land. And for, for some of us, that same thing can happen. So we don't, we don't allow what happened to Israel to happen to us, okay? Uh, uh, so when we, sometimes we're going to look through this, when we, when we get too close to the culture, 
of worldliness, that culture of worldliness begins to impact us. And that's where Paul is talking about these liberties. Okay, yep, you have liberties, but be careful how, those, how you use those liberties because if, if you spend too much time in that world, guess what happens? You become to start to, to look and act and feel and believe like the world believes. Okay? And so you have to be very careful. We are the ones who are supposed to be like a city that is set on a hill, a light that shineth that all men can see, right? It's supposed to be us that makes an influence in the world. But when the world starts corrupting the church and starts corrupting the, the people of God, then we're in big trouble. It's a big danger at that point. And that's what happened to the people of God. That's what happened to the, to, to the children of Israel, okay? And, and sometimes we can feel mature. We can feel gifted. We can feel adequate in our relationship with, uh, with Christ, only to have our mooring come loose and everything just to wash away. I, I, I mean, in my short time here, I've talked to people. Man, I've gone through Awana. I've gone through Sunday school. I've been through life groups. I've been through one-on-one -on -one discipleship. And now, I don't know if I believe in God. The mooring is just loosed, right? Going through a trial, going through a, a difficulty in life, right? And, and that's what happens. Uh, sometimes we just get so close to that world, the world begins to impact us, and we almost begin to doubt what is happening in this world? Is God really in control anymore? I see so much evil. Dan Jellowick just witnessed somebody getting doused with kerosene and dying and outside of his gate. How could this happen? What kind of wicked people would kill somebody over a light bulb? You start to doubt if God is love, if God's all-powerful. You know, that's what the world says, isn't it? That's what the world teaches. If your God's a loving God, why doesn't he do something about these starving kids in Ethiopia? Why does he allow these Sudanese to be, uh, uh, you know, why does why, chi child trafficking, why does he, if God is so good, if he's so powerful and almighty, where is he in all of this? Right? But he is all powerful. And when we allow the culture to penetrate our thinking, we lose our Mooring, okay? Exodus chapter 16. Why don't you turn there? It's a Bible study tonight, so let's flip our Bibles open. Exodus chapter 16. It says they did eat and they did drink of that spiritual meat and that spiritual drink, okay? This is the text. Exodus chapter 16. We'll be in the Old Testament a little bit. So are we flipping pages? Are we doing okay? Exodus 16 verse 15. In the King James, the Bible says, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. For they wist not what it was, and Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Okay? So this is that sustenance I was just talking about. He is going to provide for them every day food in the desert. Where there was simply nothing, God is going to sustain them. When we look at this, he says, This rock that followed them, the rock was Christ. So it's literally Jesus that strengthens them, that feeds them, that protects them, that guides them, and that walks with them. Flip over to Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, He, speaking of God, is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he, okay? So he's talking about this same rock. Uh, he's just given us a description. He's now, this same God is the one that's leading them through the wilderness. First Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2, flip there with me. Verse 2. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God, okay? That strength, that power that you, when, that you see. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 47. 2 Samuel 22, verse 47. 
He says it this way, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. Okay, there's a strength that's associated with Jesus Christ. He is called the rock in this text, and the rock was Christ. He was there the whole time. He tells Peter in Matthew chapter 16, upon this rock I will build my church. Okay? So we see this. It's, it's not just a one-off occasion, but it's throughout the entirety of Scripture that Jesus Christ has promised to be with his people. No matter what they go through, the trials, the difficulties, the temptations, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He said it in the New Testament. He said it in the Old Testament. He is a God that is a rock that we can stand on that ground. Okay? Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 10. But... You know, when you see that word but, you know you're in trouble, right? It's that it means everything that he just said. There's going to be a problem now, okay? But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness, okay? Uh, it doesn't appear that with many of them he was well pleased. It appears that with most of them, okay? It's really only Joshua and Caleb that get to enter in. So let's cut to the chase a little bit. Eh, there's only two that I actually like, I mean, that are actually faithful in all of this. And, and uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it tells tells us in verse 6 that without faith it's impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay? So when we look at this text and he says that many of them God was not well pleased, what he's saying is with many of them there was no faith. Because faith is what pleases God. Faith is an action to understand and act upon what we understand. That is what is well-pleasing to our Lord. To understand but do nothing does not please God. We've got to be hearers of the Word of God because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's like a, a two-edged sword. of pierces. But if all we do is hear and we don't actually do what the Bible says, we have deceived our own selves. And that's what happened to the children of Israel here, okay? They had been deceived that they've received of God, but they were not doing the things that were pleasing in the sight of the Lord. So First Bible Baptist Church, I know that you are here today because you want to receive of the Word of God, and for that I commend you, and I'm grateful that you're here. But I don't want you just to receive the Word of God. I want you to live the Word of God. I want you to be a people that take that and meditate and think about it, speak to your spouse, speak to your children, that, that, that deeply come to an understanding and grip of who God really is. And it transforms your life and the way you deal with everything in life. We want to be a people that are not overthrown. We want to be a people that please our Lord. Now, we're not talking about losing our salvation here, okay? We're not talking about, uh, uh, you know, if, if we don't do what we need to do, that we're going uh, to miss out on heaven. What we're talking about is missing out on what God designed us for, okay? Missing out on, on his perfect plan for our life. This is what God wants for us, okay? There are uh, an example to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to, to us, right? To the people of Corinth, to the people of this church, the Corinthian culture was much about prosperity. It was much about sexual pleasure. It was much about wealth and feeling good. There were very few boundaries in the Corinthian church. Remember the, the temple of Aphrodite who had a thousand temple prostitutes would go into the city and, uh, you know, and, and the average people had 20 to 30 different marriages and, and the different things that were taking place in this culture were just like, wow, it's amazing, right? Now, when we look at our own culture, I feel like we're pretty similar in some ways to the Corinthian culture. We are so infatuated with pleasure, with entertainment, with money and greed and lust and power and reputation. And we're very similar to the same problems that the people of Corinth were having. We are the same problems that we are still having today in 2017 in the church of Jesus Christ here in the United States and maybe even here at 990 Manitow Road in Hilton, New York, right? 
Because the reality is the same sins that beset the people back then uh, uh, for Israel beset the people of Corinth, and there's the same besetting sins that hurt us today because it's a heart issue, not a culture issue. It's, it, it's not a medical issue. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's not an industrial issue. It's a heart issue that hurts us. Until the heart is changed, nothing can be solved, right? That's where we're at, okay? There's very, we live in a time of absolute liberty, right? Where uh, what personal belief is all that really matters. The facts are becoming irrelevant. A boy can say that they are a girl because they simply believe it, right? Well, that's what I feel. I, I, I want to, I don't care what my chromosomes say. I want to feel like a girl. I feel like a girl, so I'm going to be a girl. We can, a person can have a sex change if they want. They can move from being a boy to being a girl. You know, the, it, it's ridiculous what can take place. Absolute liberty leads to chaos. A lack of clarity and definition is dangerous, okay? In our, in our church, we have uh, a lot of liberty as well. We have a, a lot of people that don't believe it's necessary. They feel that they have liberty. They don't need to attend church to be a part of the church. We have liberty. I don't feel like I need to give financially to be a part of the church. I, I don't feel like I need to serve to be a part of the church. I don't feel like I need to gather. I don't feel like I need to sit under the preaching of God's word. I don't need to corporately come together and praise. And I don't need to receive the Lord's Supper. I don't need to do what the Bible tells me to do because I have liberty in Christ. See the danger in that? We use our liberty at some point, it goes out of bounds, and there's a confusion where people say, well, I don't need to go to church because I am the church. And man, I get what you're saying, but there's a danger in what you're saying as well. You know, in the first century, second century, third century, when the church of Christ was young, it was a persecuted church, and you know what you found is that Christians were being killed for their faith because they were gathering together. For some reason, the, the early church felt the need to risk their entire life to come together and be with other Christians in fellowship. Why in the world would the early church risk their entire life to come together to pray and to serve each other and to love one another if it really didn't matter? Because it does matter. Joining together in fellowship, joining together in service, loving and exalting, praising and worshiping, encouraging each other to go out and risk your life for the sake of the gospel, and that's powerful. We don't do that lightly. We do that out of need because the Bible draws us to that place. He, temptation is, is often misunderstood in this text. He says, verse 6, now these things, uh, uh, verse six, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Okay? And so we're going to go through this. We're going to talk about temptation and struggles and uh, uh, the reality of all these things. But they're warning us. They're, this is an example that we should not lust after evil things. Okay, the tragedy in all this is that many people can trust God to get them out of Egypt, or if you will, we can trust God to get us out of the penalty of sin, but we don't trust God enough to get us into Canaan, or get us into that promised land, or get us into the abundant life that we should have now. So now we're given four main examples of sin which derailed the children of Israel in here. Okay, so in verse 7 he says, Neither be ye idolaters, verse 8, neither let us commit fornication, verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, uh, and then verse 10, neither murmur ye. Okay, so here is the examples that are being given. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 32. Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible. Keep your, keep your string in uh, 1 Corinthians. We'll be back there as well. Okay. <clears throat> Exodus 32, he says, Neither be ye idolaters. Okay, we've got to go to these Old Testament passages so that we can learn what the New Testament is teaching us. 
Uh, there's, there's some that just want to stay in the New Testament. You know, it's just that we're New Testament Christians. The Old Testament is written so that we can understand, okay? Let's look at these examples. Let's look at people that have gone through this. Exodus chapter 32, okay? Verse 1, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said to them, up, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron and received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be the gods of these be, and these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings <clears throat> and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Verse 7, The Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Okay? So we see what is taking place here so very quickly. It's idolatry. They are making, a, they're fashioning a God after their own likings. Okay? And this is where we have to be very careful. When Christians worship anything or anyone else that, be, that is besides God, it is idolatry. Okay? We can talk about worshiping Mary, the saints, we can talk about icons, we can talk about angels, we can talk about our children, we can talk about our spouse, we can talk about sports heroes, we can talk about politicians that we think are going to deliver our nation, we can think about positions, wealth, prosperity, vehicles, boats, vacations. All of this can be idolatry. Idolatry has nothing to do with sincerity. Hindus are very devout people. They make their prayers, they burn their incense, they give sacrifice. Muslims, very devout people. Roman Catholics can be very devout people. I've met a lot of Roman Catholics, they go to church more than you do. Met a lot of Roman Catholics that give and, and sacrifice and go and do. I've, I've met some in Zambia that have been missionaries longer than I were, and they're sweet people, okay? But they also pray to Mary. They also just believe things that are just ungodly and unbiblical and just plain old wrong. It's idolatry. I know some Baptists that are very devout. in their sincerity. And because I'm Baptist, I believe I'm right. And we can actually worship a denomination, a movement, and anything that is not centered on Christ where he is not the absolute focus of the thing is idolatry. It doesn't matter how sincere I feel about it, how much energy or how much I sacrifice for it, it is idolatry if it does not line up with the God of the Bible. This is where we got to be. That's why it's so important to have a, a more sure word of prophecy. It's so important for us to have God's truth to, to make sure. Moses was given the Ten Commandments. The first one, Exodus 20, says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the very first commandment that God gave. He says in uh, 1 John chapter 5, almost the end of the Bible, he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols because idolatry is always an issue of the heart, okay? People who follow man-made religion still claim to worship the God of the Scripture. I mean, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons, the Church of Latter-day Saints, they believe they are worshiping the God of the Bible, but they're not. 
So what they're doing is technically idolatry, okay? The children of Israel justified and believed that when they took their earrings, they put them in the fire, and the priest, Aaron, who they respected, carved out a molten uh, calf, and this thing, came, this thing came out, and they bowed before, and, they were, and he said, look, here's your gods. They all believed. Here we go. This is good. And they burnt incense. They did it. They they had this mix of of uh, paganism, and they had this mix of uh, of Judaism. And they were very sincere. They sacrificed. They gave. They came together with great intensity, and they were absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. That is idolatry. Nobody. Nobody bows down, nobody sacrifices, nobody does what they do religiously because they think they're wrong, right? Everybody, every religion, every people that, that whether you're in Islam or uh, Buddhism or Christianity, whatever it is, what you do is because you think what you do is correct. That's what the children of Israel were doing. All these people gathered together and they were doing this whole thing together, but they were wrong. Anything that takes our first allegiance and a loyalty away from God is an idol. It is always a sin of the heart that hurts us the most, okay? Many of us, if I, if I, if I carved out an image and said, look, there's God, you would say, no, that's not God. That's a carving, and we're not going to bow down because you're so intellectual, you're so achieved in this room, right? But many of us, we would sacrifice time. We would sacrifice resources. We would re- sacrifice uh, our health. We would sacrifice our family for some sort of achievement that we think is so necessary in our life. Could be deemed idolatry, couldn't it? Sacrificing yourself. And oftentimes, our moral standards to achieve whatever that God of success is, right? Because at the end of the day, we need him to help us. Verse 8, he goes on in 1 Corinthians. Keep your finger in the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8, he says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and 20,000. Okay, here we go again, right? Numbers chapter 25. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It seems like sexual sin continues to be a part of the Corinthian church. I feel like I've talked about it. Uh, We talked about pornography a couple times here. Uh, We've talked about fornication in the church. We talked about uh, some crazy stuff, okay? But uh, again, here it is. So in Numbers chapter 25, it says, uh, And Israel abode and Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredoms with the daughters of Moab. Okay? And so in this context, there is idolatry, there is immorality, and oftentimes idolatry and immorality are very closely linked together. In verse 2, it says, And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. You see, what was supposed to take place was Israel was supposed to impact these nations of the world, but instead the nations of the world were impacting Israel. They were supposed to go out and speak of God's goodness, but instead they were having sexual relationships with the women. God was not well pleased with this. The same thing happened to King Solomon. It says in 1 Kings 11 that he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. See, many Christians fall into moral problems because they are overconfident in themselves. They enter in continuing relationships that the relationship themselves that itself may not be wrong, but the relationship offers a temptation that eventually overcomes them. And when the over when they when the when the temptation overcomes them, it becomes sin, right? 
the illustration, uh, uh, there used to be a day that I would go to the gym and, and, and bench press, okay? I try not to do that anymore because I think it's very, very dangerous to put this bar over your head with all this weight on it. I mean, the possibilities, somebody could get hurt doing that, right? So, but what you do is you, you go to the gym and, and you're, trying to, you're trying to strengthen yourself and so you have to push yourself and, and you have somebody that's called a spotter that stands over you and, and, and just holds that just a little bit with their fingers, right? And so, you know, you start eight, nine, you know, and by, you're kind of struggling, you know, to get those last couple out and then you get done, you put some more weight on that thing and you do some more, and, you know, six, uh, right? Uh, you know, and then the spotter says, you can do it, you know, and he, uh, right, and you grunt, and it's really, it's great, okay? Uh, but eventually you get to that point where you can't do it, where you push as hard as you can, and that bar just doesn't go anywhere. And if that spotter wasn't there, what would happen? It's dangerous, isn't it, Jerry? You've seen it happen. He's at the gym all the time, right? That thing would come back down. It could crush your chest and people get hurt, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, the reality is the same thing is true with sin. The only way you can know how far you can go is by going too far. The only way you can know how far, to go, how far is too far is to go too far. That's, that's the problem with this. Okay? And, and that's the warning that he is, Paul is trying to give us. Man, don't be like these people. Jesus reminds us, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after has committed adultery already in his heart. We have to be careful that we don't have eyes that are full of adultery. Paul already told us in 1 Corinthians 6, we are to flee fornication. We're not supposed to belly up next to it. We're not supposed to get real close to it. Yeah. Right? And here's we go again. Okay, we're going to harp on this for a second. And so, what we do is you go, listen, I'm not involved in a sexual relationship. I'm not. Trust me, Pastor, I'm not. Okay? What do you watch on TV? I mean, honestly, some of the stuff that we allow on the television, you know, chick flicks, right? I mean, I've, I know what a chick flick is, right? It's a romance story that this couple falls in love, but the majority of the time what happens they end up in a, in a non-marital sexual relationship, and we go, oh, isn't that beautiful? You know what that does? That corrupts us a little bit. It corrupts us a little bit. The violence that we allow on our television or, or what we're watching on the Internet or, 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 or social media, whatever it is, and, and all of these things are overwhelming our senses so that fornication no longer seems like it's a sin, it's just what people do. It's just a reality of life. People have sex. So what? Well, according to God, you don't do that. You don't do it. It's sin in the eyes of our holy God, and it has damaged so many people. It is designed for intimacy. It is designed to take two people and bring them together in one. And when it's not done that way, it breaks apart so many things. Verse number 9, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, it says this. So we've talked about idolatry. We've talked about fornication. Uh, and this fornication that I talked about here, God smote them. And one day, and there's 20, uh, uh, 23,000 people that died. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ as some of us also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Okay? So in verse 9, let's go to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21. We'll start reading in verse 4. It's again the children of Israel. They're in the wilderness. Numbers 21, verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. You ever been there? <laughs> I'm so tired of eating this food. Isn't there something else we can eat? And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray 
unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had been, uh, uh, had bitten any man when he had beheld the serpent of the brass, he lived. Okay? And so we see this taking place, this uh, tempting, this treading on God's grace. He literally was providing food and manna for the people, but that was not enough. They wanted more. They wanted spice, right? They wanted variety in life. Israel had no concern for pleasing God. They felt that God existed to please them. See, we can all get up, create, we can all get kind of sucked into that prosperity vacuum where we just want to rub that big belly of God and tickle him just right that he'll give us whatever we want, right? He doesn't exist. He doesn't, he doesn't, that's not how it works, okay? We were created for his pleasure, okay? And then that's real deep, that's mature stuff right there, realizing that God does not exist for our, but we exist for his pleasure, that we may honor him and glorify him. That is the problem. Many of the Corinthians were pushing the limits of their liberty to, to see how much they could indulge in and enjoy without going too far, but the line that it's really never is defined. And some of the Christians say we're still, we live in this age of grace, and therefore, there is nothing that is off limits to the church of Jesus Christ today. God is love, and because God is love, God is graceful. He obviously wants me to enjoy this life, and so he is willing to give me whatever makes me happy. That's just not true. God doesn't do that, okay? And that's what's taking place in this text right here. They went too far, and so they were chastised. God has limits. Even though he is a God of great grace and mercy, he draws a line. And for Israel, there was a judgment. And when that judgment uh, 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 was brought upon Israel, there was many that were killed by the serpents. Okay? Hebrews 12, 6 says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And so he loved Israel and was willing to give them a chastening. Let us not tempt the limits of his grace. Next we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse uh, 10, he says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. In Exodus 14, we see they murmured soon after they left Egypt. They said, What, were there no graves in Egypt? You had to bring us into the wilderness to kill us? Exodus 15, they reached Marah and found the water was bitter Exodus 16, they complained because they were, they were hungry. Uh, in Numbers 11, they murmured against uh, uh, because of the manna. They were sick and tired of eating this food from heaven. They wanted meat. And that's a tough one, isn't it? How many of us would complain? You know, as I go through this list, I think to myself, these people, what's wrong with them? And then I think about myself. Go on a long journey, show up, and there's, there's, there's salty water. I don't think I'd be real happy with that. Eat the same exact food every day. I'm not sure I'd be real happy about that either. You know, in Zambia, we eat the same. There was this in Shima, just a clump of, of cornmeal that we ate. It was real plain, had no, had no, had no taste to it. And, and I would eat it probably four or five times a week. And every now and then I'd come home uh, on Wednesday night from being out in the bush and my wife would have made it for dinner. And I would say, she'd say, oh, I made in Shima tonight. And I'd say, I don't want in Shima tonight. I want meat. I want pasta. I want something that's got flavor to it, right? Because we want variety. And when we don't get what we want, what do we do? We complain. We murmur. And what is murmuring? What is complaining? It's dissatisfaction, isn't it? That eventually points our finger to God and says, it's your fault. 
I'm not happy. Do something about this. That's what complaining says. That's what complaining does. We see that throughout this. We see they complained when the, in, in Numbers 14 when the ten spies came back and said the land is full of giants. People complained, oh no. We see in Numbers 16 the, the, the leadership of Moses and Aaron was criticized. We see uh, in, 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 in chapter 16 when the congregation murmurs against Aaron and Moses, the earth opens up and swallows some of them. We see at the end of that chapter 14,000 people die in a plague in response to God's anger. The same complaining and the same grumbling was what Paul was up against at Corinth, okay? Now the Bible tells us in, in the New Testament, do all things, in Philippians 2, do all things without murmuring and without disputing, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, we'll, we'll get through this, okay? Now all these things happen, verse 11, now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. This in sample means to exemplify, to show by example, to be a, pa a pattern or a model for imitation. An admonition is a correction. It's a direction that we are supposed to take. It's instruction. It's counsel. So all these things took place in ancient Israel. And we could even say, and all these things took place at Corinth so that we could learn from these things and not make the same mistakes that have already been made. He says in verse 12, wherefore let him thinketh that he stand, take heed, be careful. Take heed, he says, lest he fall. What he's, what he's trying to say is, don't be like the children of Israel. Don't be like the church at Corinth that felt so comfortable in their liberties that they were willing to stand on the edge of a cliff thinking they were safe, not realizing that if you just get too close, you're going to get burned. Proverbs 6, verse seven, or 27 says this, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? No. How close can you get to the fire? A little bit closer, a little bit closer until what happens? You get burned. You get burned. And that's what we're trying to avoid, aren't we? Okay? So learn from Scripture. Take heed. People play with social drinking today like it's nothing. People, it's okay to have a few, it's okay to do this. It's not a big deal. And the next thing you know, people's lives. I, I've had a couple in my, in my office that told me their story. It started in a neighborhood, innocent enough. It started with just a few drinks, innocent enough. And then this man was having a relationship with the other neighbor's wife because they had loosened up. They had relaxed their standards they were no longer coherent to realities and the moral guides of life, and they were now in an adulterous relationship. Well, that happened quickly, didn't it? Social drugs, greed, soft pornography, wealth, the pursuit of wealth. It's a rare case in which a person does not get entangled by drinking, sex, drugs, money, lust, greed, power, or get spoiled by the influences of violence, anger, and destructive behavior. See, it all has an influence in our life. So he says, take heed. Yeah, you have liberties. You can, you can go and you can watch. You can go to these shows. You can go to the... The Bible says, you know, it doesn't say do not watch R-rated movies. But let me tell you, they're just not good for you. I know, but where does it say not to? Okay, you're right. Go ahead and do it. Let's see how it helps your spiritual walk with the Lord. Because that's what we're trying to do, remember? We are created for His pleasure, not for our pleasure. So when we say, well, I have liberty to do it, that's because it's my pleasure. I'm thinking about me right now. Verse 13, this is where we'll finish. There has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. 
Man, as we think about everything that we just talked about, all that Israel's been through, all that the Corinthian people are going through, and all that we are going through, because by the way, he, he says, there is no temptation taking you, but it's such as is common to man. The temptation that you're facing today, the, the struggles that you are facing today, whether it's, whether it's sexual temptation or whether it's complaining or murmuring or idolatry or, or fear or unbelief or whatever it is that, is that is there, it's common. It's the same temptation that mankind has been dealing with from the beginning. You are not an island. You're not alone. These people struggled the same as you and I struggled. He says, there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But, don't you love the but in this case, right? God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it, okay? Victory is always available. A believer can always make it through the trying of their faith in righteousness. And what I, I want you to be careful what I just said. The believer can make it through the trying of your faith because God is not going to take the trying of your faith away. He is going to be faithful through the trying of your faith. We see Job as a great example in the Bible. We see Job, Satan comes to God and God says to Satan, <laughs> have you thought about Job? What? I mean, are you kidding me? You just told Satan he's a good one to try. And that whole time, Satan abused him, took his family away from him, took his possessions away from him, and allowed his friends to, to hurt him. But God is faithful. Matthew chapter 4. Turn to Matthew chapter 4 for a second. Then was Jesus, verse 1, Matthew chapter 4, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You see who's leading him? The Spirit of God is leading him to be tempted of the devil. Now, oftentimes we don't recognize at the time of our testing, at the time of our temptation, that God is the one that's working in us through us, but that is exactly what has happened. The temptation of mankind, it, it's common to all of us. The struggles, whether it's in our marriages, whether it's with our children, whether it's with pride or anger or peer pressure, fear, doubt, anxiety, lust, greed, disobedience, whatever it is, these things are common to man. But God is faithful. We do not need to be overwhelmed by these things because the Bible doesn't say that God is going to take away those things, but he is going to make a way that we could escape, that we could get through these things because he has promised that he is the God of all creation, and at the same time he's the God of all creation, he reigns from heaven, and the, and, and, and from, uh, from, uh, heaven above and in the, and the affairs of men below. And at the same time, he is with me and has promised that I would never leave me nor forsake me. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because my God is there. Because he is faithful and can make it through the trials. I can make it through the temptations. I can make it through this life and do according to what is pleasing unto God. I don't have to loose my mooring and be completely destroyed by the waves and the wind and the rain and the, all that. And I can, I can set my, my foundation on the rock, on the Lord Jesus Christ. I can only be destroyed if I'm just on sand if I don't have true strength. But man, if I'm on Christ, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what takes place. God is faithful. He is that rock. He is my hope. He is my help. He is my endurance in this life 
and for everything to come. So man, it doesn't matter what you're facing. I don't need to list your struggle that you're going through, whether it's cancer or, or, or whether it's financial problems or whether it's marital problems or whatever it may be. I can say with great assurance that God is faithful and that he won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And he won't deliver you either. But he will be with you through that all. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are uh, so good to us, even in our hardships, even in our difficulties, even in our struggles. God, help us not to be a people that are overthrown in the wilderness like the children of Israel. God, help us not to use our liberties incorrectly like the, the Corinthian church. But God, would you bring a, a righteous balance of grace and truth into our lives that, God, we would sacrifice our liberties for the gospel's sake. Lord, show yourself faithful. Even tonight, God, would you help us overcome? Would you reveal yourself to us yet again through the Scripture? Would your Spirit give us great peace and strength and comfort? May the joy of the Lord be our strength this day. We ask for your blessings, your face to shine down upon us, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget to give each other a, a good hearty greeting uh, before you go. See you next, see you Sunday. Hope to see you Sunday.